Hello, and thank you for joining our LinkedIn Live series, where we are continuing to explore how data and analytics are influencing a wide range of industries. My name is Jeremy Petranka. I am the Associate Dean of the Quantitative Management Programs at Duke University's Chico School of Business. Our Master of Quantitative Management programs are designed to bridge the gap between more modern data science tools and the specific operational and strategic needs of businesses. So my feel is that if we ask the average person where data is being used by companies, a lot of individuals would mention digital marketing. And while that's right, in some ways, it's just the tip of the spear in terms of how data is helping marketing and consumer facing groups do their jobs better. So today we're going to be able to get into really the details of this. And I'm happy that I'm being joined by Dawei Kim, a 2020 graduate of our MQM program. So he actually had some experience in the consult, uh, consulting sphere before coming back to the program. But since he's been working for Procter & Gamble's data and analytics team in their global headquarters in Cincinnati, he's currently a senior manager focusing on North America's uh, consumer analytics. And he helps the category teams and the retailer consumer teams use data science to answer the questions that they, they really need answering. So Dawe, thank you very much for coming on today. And I'm extremely excited to start diving in. Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me. And it has been three years since I graduated. Time flies, but really happy to be back and talk with people about my job, my experience. And hopefully in the future, more and more FUQA alumni will be there as well. Uh, I share that hope. And it is, it is amazing <laughs> to think that it's been three years <laughs> since you were here. All right. So with that, I want to go ahead and dive in. And one of the neat things is in this series, we've talked with, with someone who was at the really startup phase. And if you think about the life cycle and the data maturity level, what's great is that you are at the complete opposite of that, is that you are you know, at a, at a huge multinational corporation. You have the resources, you have the data, you have the reach to really maximize what data can do. So I think looking at, at these questions through your lens is going to be you know, really valuable in terms of understanding where data science is and, and where it can go, especially on the consumer side of things. So with that, though, where I want to start is to get a feel for what marketing looks like today using data. And in particular, I, you know, it, it still feels that a lot of people feel like marketing is kind of a bifurcation, that on one hand, you have you know, traditional marketing, where you're going to be talking about you know, customer discovery, kind of broad campaigns, um, a lot of relationship management. And then on the other, you have you know, the world of marketing analytics, really broadly defined, where you start having you know, really customized uh, campaigns that you send out, really hyper-focused marketing to individuals based on you know, what you think you know about them. And so one of the things I wanted to ask you is, is this way of thinking valid in terms of this kind of this split? Or has what marketing is, has it just changed or evolved into something that its own thing now? Yeah, from my experience at PNG, I think commercial marketing is involved definitely, and and to be honest, mix the two ways you mentioned. We have philosophy that every action and decision should be data driven. For instance, if you know Gillette Men's um, deodorant, if you search on Amazon, you will find the color of the product is actually changing from dark blue to light blue to attract to attract more customers and more consumers. Or Tide Pods, the front side is less word now with straightforward functionality like code what a clean. The first time you have those ideas, maybe from UX or some traditional user testing, but what's next? You cannot just spend a large amount of money and change all your brand image, you know, without testifying, right? So now marketing analytics comes with more data points. You can tell how much lift improvement this change has brought to the business or even more detailed, what kind of consumers love this change. And if you want to do a target specifically those kind of consumer, or if you want to board your idea. So after that, you can expand your activities to the national level, even like regional level. In other words, marketing today is actually bridging data and business to enhance traditional marketing practice rather than replacing them altogether. Are you finding that people going into P&G's marketing group or just more broadly in the industry, they have to have, you know, it might not be a full data science skill set but they have to have some um, understanding of, of data-driven decisions or at least some experience with some kind of analytical toolkit? So from um, my experience at PNG, I think we have both. Like there are some group of people, they know data analysts, they know a little bit of SQL or Python, but they have super, super talent in the marketing area. And then I'm actually in the position with more like data science skills. And every decision that is actually made by 
two groups together. So we work together closely and then make every decision together. Not like some people in the marketing that just, you know, make the sole decision without data science or the data scientists just provide recommendation without marketing knowledge. So it's mixed. And, and, I, and, I, and I'm going to want to dig into that more about how you have it structured. But before we kind of look at mm -hmm. the, the organizational piece, which, which I think how you do that can have very different results. Let's actually get into more kind of the details of, of what you're seeing how these tools are being used in particular, you know, when, when, you know, you see kind of mainstream reporting on, on you know, machine learning and AI and data science, a lot of times it's really the cutting edge, you know, mm -hmm. with chat GPT, you know, it's going to change everything. But I think a lot of what is actually happening in terms of, you know, how marketing analytics is done is a little bit more of the, you know, the, the boring side of things. And what I mean by that is it's not this you know, transformational flashy thing. It's instead behind the scenes, possibly has been there for a while, but those things that are actually making uh, people that are customer facing better, faster, smarter at what they do mm -hmm. without necessarily having this, you know, zero to one transformation happening. Can you give kind of the environment of what that part of the equation looks like in terms of, you know, getting more into the detail on, on how you're using analytics? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, I can give you a specific example. It's boring, by the way, but it's essential. <laughs> um, that's distribution. So with the scanning data, the retailer analytics team and distribution manager, they can you know, easily and quickly check which product are uh, unsellable this week and predict which products will be potentially be out of stock next week. It's boring. Now the magic happens when you have per store, per SKU data. Imagine we don't have that you know, an automated dashboard with frequently updated data, which was actually the situation that occurred eight years ago when I did my internship in a luxury good company, sorry. But at that moment, I had to receive emails from each physical store and load the stock number in my Excel file and do all the manual stuff. And that was only 200 stores. Imagine for PNG, it is definitely, you know, the entire US stores and then all the retailers. So if you're all doing the manual stuff, it is crazy, but now today, PNG is definitely a leader in digital transformation and the data science in the you know, consumer good industry. And it has to be leader because of that big amount of data, especially with tons of product IDs and retailer stores all over the world. And I would say it's boring, but it's essential that we have automated dashboard for each different you know, use case and you know, support all the different marketing team and also the customer team. So yeah, the distribution is definitely one of the super good example here. So when you're when you're talking about the SKUs for people that don't, it, I think it can be hard for some people to kind of get their head around how big P and G, for instance, is. And you know, it's it's not alone in the, in that sphere, especially in consumer goods. Mm -hmm. Can you give an idea of, of how granular one SKU is in terms of what you're keeping track of? Yeah, definitely. I can tell you that we have plant, right? Plant, and then the factory, and then we have the daily you know, delivering data per SKU, per product ID, we have around 700 columns per product, <laughs> which was in the, with like benefits, gender, form, segment. And then you imagine that, and then you have that for each category. Well, I'm talking about fabric care, home care, tied laundry, tied unit, tied those, whatever. So it's that granular. And then we also have, you know, based on the time, frame we have weekly data daily data and also have monthly data as well per store per neighborhood or per u.s census group so that is crazy if you do manual work that will be crazy um yeah so that's the granularity here i'm talking about <laughs> yeah and i think one thing that i hadn't um i hadn't really thought about when when you know when we were going to talk was how closely especially with the industry you're in how closely the marketing and the distribution has to be tied together because of the scale that you have to operate mm -hmm. on is that it, 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 it feels like you, you, you almost can't disconnect them at this point in order, in order to achieve any kind of scale. Is that, does that feel right? Oh, uh, it depends. <laughs> to be honest, it depends, but we do have a, a entire like department for supply chain only. And then we do have like, even for the drivers who, you know, drive from, because PNG own the distribution here from plant to the retailer. So you, if you go to the, you know, drive on the highway, you will see some PNG brand with the, you know, the truck logo, you know, so, uh, it depends. <laughs> 
No, no, that, uh, and, and I, with any very large organization, that's probably going to be the answer. Yes, <laughs> yeah, I have to do this. Yeah, it depends. <laughs> Okay, so moving moving past the you know the boring ones, and realistically, that you know not not really boring, and in fact, absolutely critical to what you do. But let's actually turn to the other side of that, the mm-hmm. ones that you know have the bigger bang, um, the, the ones that we tend to see how ha- either have or have the potential of being really transformational in terms of how we do things. Have you seen anything, or, or what are some of the approaches that you found that really seem to have changed the game, or mm-hmm. are changing the game in terms of where we're going? Yeah, so there's a post from our PNG um, CBO, the chef brand officer. He mentioned that the biggest opportunity for market growth is the, the multicultural market. In the past 10 years, around you know, 100% of U.S. population growth come from increase in Black, Hispanic, Asian, Pacific you know, Island, Native, multicultural, multi-race segments, which their buying power was more than $5 trillion. So when market grow, everyone benefits, and we grow the you know, picture and create business versus taking from others. So I know people don't like the pie chart, but growing market is actually more important kind of growth, you know, and we are actually not increasing a percentage of pie chart, but we're increasing the entire size of the pie. So a super cool approach I observe is micro-targeting based on demographic attributes. It comes from a data science method, which, you know, with a much more granular mindset, you will be able to understand or find who your product resonates with and see more of them. For instance, if I'm talking about in a university neighborhood, maybe people are busy with midterm or finals and they want to use type pods to throw just one or two small balls into the laundry machine and finish the laundry work because they still have to do the exam, right? They need to do a review. They don't have time. Oh, how can a business utilize a back to school season in August and September when people are buying things crazily? Do we give more discount or do we you know, make the price a little bit higher so we can even do more granular? What are the products that African-American consumer love more in the hist- historical black college and university? We call it the HBCU areas. So multicultural, multi-demographic targeting is a super cool and advanced approach today. And then with a huge business opportunity here. So in terms of then, you know, you talked before about uh, on you know, each, individual, uh, each individual product, you have you know, 700, 700 columns of information, the micro-targeting you're talking about, it sounds, you know, very much. There's got to be a lot of data underneath that, and so one of the things that that I know, um, I know some folks would love to hear about, is the kind of data that you're able to access. And I don't necessarily mean the in-house PNG piece, although you know, feel free to talk about that if you'd like. But really, what you can buy. I think a lot of people, especially people just getting into data science kind of think the data begins and ends with what a company has mm-hmm. and doesn't realize how much data is viable that you can purchase a lot of this data and the data that's out there. When you start thinking about data privacy, you know, these types of things come up. Could you talk about what some of the data sets are that let you and let a large organization really start, start targeting at this level? Yeah, definitely. So there are two kinds of data. One is more like super sensitive, like sales data, POS data, scanning data. And uh, to be honest, we are not owning the data. Actually, the consumer who pay the product, they own the data. And, you know, the Walmart or the Kroger, they are actually manage the data based on consumer's agreement. So that's the more high sensitive part. But I am super surprised that we have some less sensitive data, but they are super good quality. When I was in Duke, when I do the you know, data project, we always go to Kaggle or UCI library and download data. And we think, oh my God, the quality is not that good. And how can I build an algorithm on that? But if you, you know, just searching on Google, maybe some name here, Cardo, special AI, you will have a data set based on the US census group. For instance, they have in per census group, per neighborhood, let's say this per census group, what are, you know, how many people are from age 10 to age 20? How many people are from age 21 to age 30? How many people love to hear about beauty supply? How many people has a guitar at home? How many people has a laundry machine? It's more like survey based and also based on the US census, you know, survey, whatever. So those data, to be honest, are not expensive. I can say this, are not expensive. And if you're doing research in a university setting, you can actually buy that. And you can also have some e-commerce data. I'm not talking about Amazon sales data. It's 
not doable, right? Because Amazon own that. They have high sensitivity. But you can go back and see, hey, in the Twitter, how many people is focused on what specific account? How many people would love to use Instagram over Facebook? And they are also doable and purchase, you know, you can also purchase them as well in several product, you know, data provider. So the cost is not like hundred million dollar or whatever. It's not that huge. And it is frequently updated every month or every half year. And the data quality so is good. Two follow-up questions for that. Um, yeah. One is for for anyone watching that uh, that didn't know that kind of data is out there and are thinking that you know someone is watching. Can you give an idea of generally how you think uh, the, the the people that sell that data how they're getting it? Is that, for instance, survey data? Is that people agreeing to to you know when you sign a customer agreement? Do you have an idea of where that data comes from originally? Mm, yeah, definitely. I can tell you that it's not an advertisement again, but uh, there's one super good pro, um, you know data set vendor called Special AI. It's more like a, a mid-sized you know entrepreneur right now in this in this system and in this you know data set world. And what they do is they actually get the uh, the Google Chrome and have all the setting with your cookies. Every time your device is searching for something in Google and then link to a specific page, let's say you want to order Thai food, and then you will have a cookie that linking from your device location and this specific Thai food location or IP address. And then that's one record. And if you click accept cookies, which we have that all the time when we review, you know, when we view a new page, accept cookies, this is actually saved in your Chrome. And if you okay to share that with the data provider sign agreement whatever people always click mark you know mark i agree right <laughs> and, then, and then it will send you you know a data provider's data set so that's one thing so, that they do yeah no no please go ahead yeah so that's one thing that they do they actually you know collect your data for your device <laughs> and another one is uh some big company for instance google again the google map Every time you're using your Google map from your home to somewhere else, they actually track your route and how many times, how busy it is. And uh, you, we can actually draw a circle from the destination to your home and then say, oh, it's 10 minutes work workable or drivable. And then if you are, let's say, if you own a business for, I don't know, for a library, let's say you have a library and you want people to do more with like read more books and go to your library. You can actually using the data to draw a circle or draw a, you know, whatever distance, walkable distance, driving distance. And then you can find your target customer is like how, like what are the age of them? Like what's the gender of them? What are the race of them? So yeah, that's another kind of data. But Google, those big companies, they own the data. And sometimes you have to be a giant company to collaborate with them. And that's the, you know, that's the data with more cost. And, and that, that makes perfect sense. I think um, one thing that, you know, I, I tend to find that fascinating. And I, I generally, um, I, I feel like I, I kind of know what happens when I accept a cookie. I think uh, that other people might not realize the level can come out. So it's probably worth talking about just kind of the ethics around this world. Because one of the things that you're talking about, any anytime technology is moving very quickly, mm -hmm. you know, there's these kind of ethical considerations on where do we want to be? What are we thinking about? And I don't want to go, you know, we could spend weeks mm -hmm. talking about the, the nuances of that. But from a high level, can you kind of give a uh, give an idea of what the ethical landscape looks like in terms of are there kind of decision making bodies? You know, who's at the table? How are those kind of thoughts? Um, you know, how are they brought together? Yeah, let me tell you one example for like more, eth let's say more high sensitive part, the sales data. And even I am a developer side and I need to do the Power BI, I need to do the coding, right? I still don't have all the full data. I need to request that data from each retailer team and from you know all the marketing team and then to get access for that specific part of data. So it is, to be honest, I always thinking 80% of the of my time is doing data cleaning when you do a project. No, actually 80% of the time is you're getting a data access from them. You have to tell them, hey, what is my purpose of my developing? What you know, how this algorithm can be more valuable to this company 
end to this industry. You cannot just, you know, using the, that data and to beat other company. You have to make that happen for, you know, make your in the entire industry more successful for your, you know, based on your algorithm usage. And so that's more like a high sensitive part. For the low sensitive part, like the one I talk about, the US Census Group, the demographic future, whatever, the demographic, you know, index, whatever, they are actually, um, you know, getting access per buyer. So you don't need to have a specific uh, access or license to get those data. All you need to do is to buy the data and then tell the provider, hey, um, what I'm going to do to do with that demographic data. And in that case, it's it's less uh, it's it's less specific because the data is aggregated at a yeah. census level. It's not yes. individual. It's, it's, you know, they don't know it's me. They just know that I live in this area that has these characteristics more broadly. Yes, correct. That it's not perfect. just an individual person. It is hey, how many people in the you know around Fuqua, and then it's around around two thousand people to three thousand people as a group, and it is defined by U.S. government by U.S. Census Group. So it is. You know, shareable to the public. That, no, that makes that makes perfect sense. So the, the part you said about you know reaching out to marketing and kind of working with them to figure out even what you can access, I now want to just talk about that more broadly. Um, mm -hmm. The the organization structure of data science teams inside of a big organization, and I, and I've seen this you know a lot of different ways. I've seen uh, a world where it's organized that there's one main data science group, and mm -hmm. most requests, especially the big ones, flow through them. I've seen an agile system um, where there's kind of like a SWAT team, and as a BU needs something, they you know fly down, do the work, fly back home. Um, I've seen some where the BUs each have their own team that may or may not talk to each other. Um, have, do you have have you given any any thought as to what the best way is, or if not the best way, what uh, and, and a company should be thinking about when structuring it? PNG actually did super good. We have data science team for all the use cases you're talking about. There are specific data science group in R&D, and feel free to apply if someone wants to, to you know, work for PNG. But for R&D, they are specifically doing one or two algorithm designing, and they are not writing all the algorithm. They are just writing a big idea and get the pattern. So that's uh, R&D focus. And there are some data science, they are in PNG data, data and analyst group. They are building from zero, uh, they're building from one to 99. They are making the algorithm better. They are making a solution. They are making a software for you know, people from business unit and customer team to use. So that's another group. And the third group is more like a SWOT team. So we do have a function called embedded data science. They are specifically for one um, category, let's say fabric here, data scientist. And when fabric here has some specific ideas or demands, they will use that resource to, um, to either write a function or do the research. So that's three uh, different groups in PNG right now. And I think because of the size of this business, super big, it's a giant company. We, you know, people, you know, the company has the ability to <laughs> hire three different kinds of group. Now, what about some like mid-size or, you know, people just taking care of the data science and say, oh, it's a powerful, but how we build a team. I believe the best way is to separate the responsibility clearly between the market team and the data science team. So the data science team should only focus on the case that uh, valuable and can be replicated to different products. And you should also have someone in the marketing team know the SQL, know the Python, and know not high-end data science, but know the data analyst. Yeah, know the data analysis stuff. And then they can be a data analyst uh, they will help with 90% of your simple questions. And another 10% case should be replicated and valuable, can move to the data science team. So that if, if you own a mid-size or small size company, I think that's the best way to do. So in terms of in, in thinking of the small and mid-size companies, um, who, who should be dominant in that? And what I mean by that is, the the marketing team, for instance, or any functional team, they're going to want one thing. The data science team might want to explore something else, especially when you're kind of resource constrained on this and mm. you can't just you know let R and D for R and D sake happen. Um, how do you feel that balance should be? 
I think there should be someone who know both business side and data side to make the decision for, hey, this case should be going to data science team. This case is valuable. Someone in the mid size or small size should be CTO, like, you know, chief technology officer, because he know the business, he know this company, and he also know the data science. In the large, you know, in a large company like PNG, what we did is a product owner or, you know, a product project manager or service manager who did that because we are actually building a small company inside of PNG, right? So, um, but in a mid size or small size CTO should be the one. Yeah. So kind of touching then on more, I, I love that um, you keep using the really the, the language of for this case, for this specific use case of what to do that, that, you know, data science, you haven't been referring to it as a, as a series of solutions or a series of techniques. It's a series of uses that you need it for, and 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 that that's really where a lot of the a lot of the heavy lift is. I think people think that it's the technical side, but you know, with the with the tools that we have nowadays and how um, accessible data science is, it feels like a lot of the challenge is getting the entire organization to be thinking about what cases should we be looking at, what could make my job easier on this. Um, have you have you seen that um, in some way challenge? And if you have, have you seen anything that it, that helps make that easier? For instance, whether it's it's the functional teams giving them some data science background, or whether it's the data science teams, you know, really having them kind of integrate more into the business. Have you seen something to make that I wonder if thing stronger? I think you will, I definitely agree with you. You will always have a business requirement or a request or demand first. Then you have data science team to develop on that. Like Tinder, it's an app, right? And then people feel lonely because people are lonely and that's a requirement, that's a demand. Then we develop a app on that. Some company or some team, they actually reverse that, which make things like they're wasting their time to, <laughs> to do the developing because you don't want to ha develop something you are super proud, but no one is using it. So uh, I learned a lesson from that as well. Like I sometimes I feel like, oh, my feature is super good and nobody is using it because it's too, too high level, sorry, too detailed level data science skills. And then there will be no people from BU team to use it. So uh, now I feel like people should learn more about requests first and then go to the, go to the data science algorithm. And Hopefully, when you do a UAT testing, when you do a first round testing, or even when you write, you know, draw a prototype, draw a UI, you always involve with the user here. So back to the question you're talking about, I think we are more and more closed, even when we are developing. From my side, I will always choose one or two superpower user. We call it superpower user who know the data science stuff, who can actually, he or she can be our data scientist in our department but he is now working on as an analyst or as a manager in the BU side. But we give them the superpower. We want to ask them what you want in this solution. And we give them the UAT testing, hey, how you want to improve it. So it is more and more mixed here. So it, it really sounds like that, it really sounds like more and more data scientists, a key skill set they need to have is the ability to think um, kind of entrepreneurially or that with that innovation lens of really being end user focused at, at all things. And, and my feel is that probably broadly defined, that's something that we haven't, we haven't pushed on significantly in the data science sphere is really having that customer lens of everything we're doing because the, the technical parts have been, um, you know, have been so uh, rigorous. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, one specific position is better than data science for like when we are studying in Duke Fuqua is BI engineering or BI intelligence developer. When we, uh, you know, study the tableau, our professor is always like, Hey, you start from left to right, start from top to bottom. And then because you want to imagine you are the users and what about data science? Do you want, when you're developing algorithm, can you think about, Hey, why people want this part of code? <laughs> do you think it's valuable or not if you are a CIO or, or a CMO, like chief marketing officer who sitting in front of the laptop? So, yeah. So I, could, 
I could, again, talk to you about this all afternoon. We didn't even get to what, where do you think this industry is moving into? And unfortunately, we are out of time. So, Dolly, thank you so much for being here today. Again, there's, I'd love to keep talking to you, um, but the, the, I am being told we are out of time. So for everyone watching, please follow Fuqua on LinkedIn to stay in the loop about these analytics conversations and also our series featuring faculty members and insights from their research.